Welcome everybody to today's RF Spectrum in Broadcast and Technical Production webinar. Uh, my name is Aldo Dreyer and I'll be moderating today's session. Just a little bit about SACIA. SACIA is the Southern African Communications Industries Association, a SACWA recognized professional body established to promote the adoption of prof professional standards and ethical business practices in the communications industry across Southern Africa. We award several professional designations to industry professionals working in the broadcast industry with individuals assessed on their education, work experience, work ethic, and an in-depth review of a portfolio of evidence supporting their claim of competence. We do these sessions to provide our members with updates on developments within the industry and the run-up to WRC23 which we'll hear a little bit about today, is a hot topic at the moment. ICASA's recent sale of radio frequencies raised 14.4 billion um, for the national fiscus, but broadcasters, technical production companies, and other users of PMSE equipment, and today we'll hear a little bit about what PMSE stands for and uh, what, what, the, what the term encompasses, um, such as wireless microphones uh, are reporting interference uh, with existing technology. In this webinar today, uh, we speak to vendors, users and industry experts to understand the current state of play in the allocation of radio frequencies in South Africa. What can be done with legacy equipment and how can interference be minimized in the future? and how can frequencies be used by local by the local broadcasting community how those frequencies can be protected against seemingly against the seemingly insatiable demand of mobile operators we also note that the minister of the department of communications and digital technologies recently issued a, a draft spectrum policy for public comment the deadline for those comments ended, um, closed on the 20th of October. Um, and this draft calls for the end of the use of 2G and 3G technologies in the country to promote the growth and adoption of 5G. So to discuss all of this, um, we are joined by um, a group of experts this morning. Um, and I'll introduce them in a minute. Um, joining me from Sakia is Kevin, the ex director um, of Sakia, and we will deal with all the technical technicalities um, of today's webinar. Um, I'll now hand over to Kevin to just explain to us how the audience poll will work. Kevin, over to you. So thanks, Eldred. During the, the course of the webinar, we're going to have a couple of polls uh, that just give us an indication of of uh, how you're responding to uh, the information that is shared. And I think perhaps a good example is let's start off with our first poll right now um, and, um, and just get an understanding of, of who, the, um, who the, the delegates in the meeting are. Um, and so I'm gonna select, what is your primary interest? Launch the poll. You've only got a couple of, um, of uh, seconds. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to uh, uh, to answer the poll and then we'll close it and share the results. So uh, who are you and what is it that you're involved in? Are you a vendor of equipment, a, a vendor of uh, services, uh, are you a user of RF equipment in broadcast or a, a user of RF production in, uh, in the technical production and live events sector? Uh, so we've had a couple of people. Here we are, let's just... Uh, I'll give it uh, five, four, three, two, one, and now we're going to close, um, and we're going to share the results. And uh, let's see who is it that's in the meeting. Uh, Thirty-three percent of vendors. Thirty-three percent of the audience vendors of wireless equipment. Uh, no vendors of wireless services. Uh, the majority of people using RF for production and um, and special events. So. I think that that's uh, we should be able to go back to the to the uh, to the live audience um, and perhaps Aldred, we can just now introduce our guests and, and get cracking. 
thank you for that, Kevin. Um, and throughout today's program, we will have a few of these polls that we will be um, doing, uh, just so that we have uh, interaction with uh, with our audience. Um, so today we have with us um, uh, the experts in the industry, um, Lyndon Petzer. Um, he is um, a consultant, uh, spectrum management consultant uh, in uh, in our industry. I've known Lyndon for, for for many years, even before he started at the at the department. Um, then we have Mark Malerba um, from ProSound, um, who, who will talk to us about uh, today about um, uh, the, the the user's perspective of. Um, um, PMSE equipment. Um, we also have with us Nada Abdel Havez. Um, she's the head of spectrum and regulatory affairs uh, for MIA um, at Sure, and she's representing APWPT, um, the Association for uh, Professional Wireless um, uh, 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 Equipment. Um, and we also have Lee Brunet. Um, who uh, is a sales representative at Sennheiser, um, and he will talk uh, to us about the, the manufacturer's perspective regarding uh, PMSE equipment. Okay, um, so to start us off, um, we will have uh, Lyndon. Um, and Lyndon will, so, I mean, many of our audience would just want to know what what is a spectrum plan and why is a spectrum plan important for a country, um, and why 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 is it necessary to have a spectrum policy, and um, you know what why should a countries be a member of the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, um, and then what bands are used um, by broadcasters as well as uh, telecommunications operators. Um, and for this, uh, Lyndon will do a, a, a presentation for us on that. And before um, Lyndon starts, I just want to read um, his profile. Um, so Lyndon, um, who, who owns Lyndon Petzer um, Consulting, has over 30 years experience in spectrum management and regulatory affairs. Lyndon has, has a wealth of experience in spectrum management and has been a member of the delegation for all the ITU World Radio uh, Conferences since 1995. Um, Lyndon has served and, and serves on various committees, including um, the chair of the SADC Committee on Satellite Experts to develop a SADC Shared Satellite Framework in, in 2018. In 2010, um, he was appointed as counselor to the South African Council of Space Affairs who is responsible for the implementation of national satellite policy and regulation of space affairs in South Africa. He was also the repertoire um, for satellite issues in the 2015 WRC and chairperson of the South African National Preparatory Working Group for the 2012 WRC. In 2020, he was the lead expert on satellite communications in a team developing a master plan for aerospace and defense in South Africa. Lyndon worked at the Department of Telecommunications and Postal Services, um, which is now known as the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies, as the Chief Director for Radio and Satellite Communication for 11 years, and is a member of the South African delegation to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Lyndon is currently the Senior Advisor to Global Satellite Operations Association. So, Lyndon, over to you. Thank you very much, Aldrich. Um, good morning to all. Um, colleagues, I could probably spend the entire time devoted for this um, webinar on this, but I believe I have five minutes. So I'm going to run through it very quickly. Starting with the ITU, the ITU is a specialized agency of the United Nations responsible for ICT. Um, it was established in 1865 as the International Telegraph Union and is 
probably the oldest of the um, international organizations. It's important to note that the ITU membership comprises the member states and it is not some bureaucracy situated in Geneva. So it is the member states that take the decisions at ITU. Now, the Constitution, Convention and Radio Regulations of the ITU are international treaties that must be adhered to by the ITU members. Importantly, Article 44 of the ITU Constitution states that spectrum is a limited resource that must be used rationally, efficiently, and economically. Um, given that the ITU recognizes spectrum as a limited resource, and the demand for spectrum exceeds the amount of spectrum available, therefore, um, services need to share spectrum. But sharing can only take place when you have compatible services. And I think as we are all aware, mobile services and broadcasting are not compatible. They cannot share the same frequency in the same geographic area. And this creates problems. Now, the radio regulations, as I indicated, are um, an international treaty. They are revised every four years at the World Radio Communication Conference. The last conference was in 2019 in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, and the next one will be in 2023 in Dubai. Um, we will talk a little bit later about um, the World Radio Conference and certain agenda items at that conference that are of importance to the broadcasting industry. However, an important part of the radio regulations is um, Article 5 of these regulations, which deals with an international table of frequency allocations. Now, frequency allocations are bands, frequency bands that are identified for various services. So, for example, 470 to 694 is allocated to the broadcasting service. Um, and these bands are then divided up in um, for the various services. However, it's also important to note that countries retain their sovereign rights in respect of national spectrum management. So the ITU deals with international cross-border issues. Within your country, you can do more or less as you please as long as you don't cause problems across borders. Um, the national allocation plan sets out um, the allocations based on the national socio-economic needs and priorities of the country um, based on uh, the table of ITU allocations. It is important to note that, for example, if we take the 700 megahertz band is allocated to broadcasting, mobile, and um, fixed services. It is then up to the policymaker, in the case of South Africa, the DCDT, to decide which of those um, services should be allocated in South Africa based on our unique requirements. There is also um, an African Telecommunication Union allocation plan as well as a SADC allocation plan. These are non-mandatory plans but are used as a guide only for um, countries who perhaps don't have their own allocation plan. South Africa's allocation plan goes back to the early 1990s and is well developed. The SADC plan was in fact to a large extent based on the South African plan uh, and the ATU plan then based on the SADC plan. Um, very briefly looking at broadcast service allocations in um, the ITU radio regulations in Article 5. 470 to 694 megahertz is allocated solely to the broadcasting service. 694 to 790 megahertz is allocated to both the broadcasting service and the mobile service. 
790 to 862 is broadcasting fixed services, i.e. point to point and mobile services. Now in South Africa, the allocation plan that was um, developed in 2021, um, 470 to 694 again is allocated to the broadcasting service. Um, 694 to 790 is allocated solely to the mobile service, the so-called IMT 700 megahertz band, although within the IQ it is both broadcasting and mobile. And similarly 790 to 862 is fixed service and mobile service, although at IQ there is also a broadcasting allocation there. So essentially in South Africa, we have 224 megahertz allocated to television broadcasting. On the other hand, currently within ITU, 19,000 megahertz has been identified for IMT. Um, we all recognize the importance of mobile broadband. We all want mobile broadband wherever we go, but you are now sitting, as I say, with 224 megahertz for broadcasting, 19,000 megahertz for IMT. Now, this goes over a number of bands. Um, in South Africa, the 450 megahertz band, 700 megahertz, 800, 900, 1500, the so-called L-band, 1800, 2100, 2.6 gigs, 3.3 .3 gigs, 3.4 gigs. Um, bands below one gigahertz are suitable for coverage applications, larger coverage areas, not as much bandwidth. The bands above one gigahertz are suitable for capacity in urban areas, and then um, the higher frequency bands, the millimeter wave bands, are suitable for um, large bandwidth but very small cells. Um, with that, I will stop for now and we will talk in more detail on WRC 23 and the controversial agenda items as they affect the broadcasting service. Thank you. Aldred, you seem to have lost your voice again. Apologies, I, I muted myself. <laughs> Thank you, Lyndon, for, for, for that um, and for explaining to us what why it's important to have a spectrum plan um, and, 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 and what uh, those allocations are um, and the applications um, uh, residing in those, in those bands. Uh, just for clarity, uh, when you speak about 470 to 694, just for the audience, um, um, that is for television broadcasting. Um, so it, it's, That's it's correct, not yes. FM. Yeah. yeah it's, okay. it's television broadcasting. Okay, excellent. Um, our next speaker um, is, 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 is Nada Ab Abdel Havez. Um, who represents the APWPT um, and she will present to us on what is PMSE and the spectrum requirements needed for PMSE. Okay, um, and before I hand over to Nada, I just want to read um, her profile. Um, so Nada is the head of spectrum and regulatory affairs for Middle East and Africa at SURE. Um, in her role, she educates and promotes the spectrum needs for the PS PMSE industry uh, in the MIA in the, uh, region. She influences regulations, uh, ensures access for spectrum, advocates spectrum policy, and promotes new technologies for audio PMSE. NADA works closely with administrations, regulatory authorities, and policymakers to enable PMSE in uh, MIA in Middle East and, and Africa. Before joining SURE, uh, Nada worked um, for Italisat, Itasalat, uh, UAE, um, where she was involved in various activities related to spectrum management. 
technology standardization and technology regulatory support. Uh, NADA holds a, a master's degree in electrical engineering and has several publications related to the optimization and, and deep learning in audio and video streaming. NADA, over to you. Thank you so much, Aldred, and thank you for inviting me to this webinar. I uh, just want to double check that you can see my slides. Yes, so we could see your slides, but you've just gone back to... Uh... Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, perfect. So, you... um, I think yeah, you can see on... Yeah. yeah, perfect. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, so... Um, Thank you so much, Adit, again, for inviting me. And uh, I would just want to give an overview really quickly on um, APWPT and introduce it to uh, uh, members here who are not really aware of it. So um, APWPT is in short for Association of Professional Wireless Production Technologies, and it's an international association. It represents really the interests of both users and manufacturers of the wireless production equipment. Um, the for, our work really focuses on uh, the frequency requirements, the frequency policies. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure if I touch anything. It seems that just... It's fine. Okay. Can you see my screen still? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, because I'm really sorry about that. I cannot see it anymore. I cannot see my slides anymore. Okay. We can see your mouse wiggling around. Yeah, because I cannot see the slides anymore. Okay, so now can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, but you're no longer in slideshow. Yeah, yeah, because I exited somehow. I'm sorry about that. Just trying to wiggle around with the uh, control panel thing here. Okay, perfect. And so, uh, how do we really work? Uh, we're more uh, quite involved in different international and uh, standardization regulation bodies. Uh, we talk to regulators, we respond to consultations um, whenever they're being released on uh, relevant topics. Uh, we do support our members with any issues they're having. Uh, we're consistently ensuring that we're providing updated information about PMSC usage, about the latest demands. And uh, we're also trying to uh, um, really advocate and influence uh, different uh, research areas. Um, we have two great papers uh, released recently, one on spectrum demands and one on um, uh, really the spectrum needs or requirements that was a uh, report released by the uh, Swiss Radio and TV. I'll also be briefly touching on it during the presentation here. So uh, quickly again, so most of the people here are from the industry and really aware of uh, audio PMSE. PMSE is an ITU inclusive term. It's short for program making and uh, special events that includes different wireless production uh, equipment like microphones, uh, in-ear monitoring uh, systems, talkback systems. And uh, it's, PMSE is a term also known as uh, SAP, which is Service Ancillary to Broadcasting, and uh, SAP, SAP, Service Ancillary to uh, Program Making within the ITU terminologies and really the applications and the needs for the different uh, PMSE events are really increasing in, in demand. Users are expecting, expectations are also increasing and we're trying to really cater for their needs and their um, expected qualities of experiences. Uh, however, right now we're challenged with the uh, increasingly re reducing spectrum available for PMSE. Now, today, it's virtually impossible uh, to say that uh, to, con to create content really without involving PMSE. And the PMSE is key to ensure that different events are properly covered, communicated, broadcasted, and they're then being used on different platforms uh, such as TV or even right now uh, OTT uh, the platforms like the streaming. Uh, and really, it's di quite diverse. Uh, the usage of PMSE across different industries, whether theater, live, TV, film, and right now even uh, with the content creators on social media, it's really important to realize that. And, and also I want to share really quickly here, this case and uh, experience really within um, uh, the Middle East. Uh, so Expo took place, um, I think almost six months back in Dubai, where it's a global event, 
uh, people from around the world are there. It was broadcasted to the rest of the world. And so we were there uh, on the uh, opening ceremony where 318 frequencies were utilized at the center uh, stage. And you can see here the screenshot from the Shure Wireless Workbench. And we're here, every little thin line that you can see here is a really a frequency assigned to a wireless device. And it's the, the spectrum here spans over more than 100 or 150 megahertz, as you can see. Uh, of course, special arrangements uh, took place with the UAE regulator to ensure that sufficient uh, spectrum uh, was given there, uh, knowing that um, uh, 5G at the time was deployed and 700 megahertz was allocated um, for the uh, five, uh, uh, mobile services. Uh, but different special arrangements were really made to ensure that uh, all, uh, spectrum is sufficient for PMSE. And also on a daily basis, more than 1,000 frequencies were used uh, across the different sites. Now, it's important to also talk to regulators about the unique requirements that PMSE has and that current 5G technology does not support it. Uh, this is something that we're constantly hearing uh, from regulators or even from the INT industry that you can host PMSE um, on uh, the 5G network. Unfortunately, we've tried. It didn't really work out. We have stringent requirements uh, for the latency. We need extremely low latency of around 4 milliseconds, less than that even sometimes, um, round trip time. Uh, between the uh, microphone or the speaker and the in-ear monitoring system. We also need uh, spectral efficiency, uh, high transmission reliability, ensuring that the sound always is received, and of, of course, the high uh, audio quality. Now, moving on to the spectrum needs. Again, the question that we're always hearing from regulators, how much spectrum do you need? It really varies based on the event. Now, typically, according uh, to some studies, 40 to 80 wireless microphones are needed on a daily basis to host uh, different events within a country. And uh, European countries, according uh, sorry, a, a LAMI report, which is a European, European study, estimated that approximately 96 megahertz are sufficient to use within the uh, uh, UHF band. And a recent report also by the SRF, the Swiss Radio and TV, um, they have summarized um, around uh, or studied around 111 events of different sizes across three years and noted that uh, different spectrum needs based on the spectrum based on the event size are um, uh, concluded here as you can see uh, 42 megahertz are required for small events 115 for large events and 174 for major events sometimes it might exceed that based on the event uh, size and scale now, going on to the hot topic at the ITU, which is the, uh, the WRC 23 agenda item 1.5, there's currently uh, work to review that, uh, to review the band really to the 470 to 694 uh, for con con considered regulatory activities of um, uh, allocate to identifying this band um, for um, INT services or allocating it for mobile services. So there's lots of different methods that are being proposed right now in the ITU, and there's a task force, task group, sorry, uh, dedicated to this uh, agenda item at the ITU right now, TG61. It concluded the um, meetings before the WRC last uh, October, and uh, we were there in the meetings. A number of different methods were proposed uh, regarding this agenda item. And we're really uh, looking forward to see what will be decided on uh, this particular item in uh, 20, WRC 23. Now, what we're also trying to... Uh, Nadi, you muted yourself. Nada? Nada, you muted yourself. Nara, can you hear us? Okay, so uh, whilst we send a note to Nada, um, it's worth noting that the reports that she uh, described when she was talking earlier uh, are available as downloads in the handouts section. 
um, and I've just received a text message uh, from my colleagues at Etisalat who have taken out a hit on Aldred for uh, slaughtering their name in his pronounce pronunciation of it. Uh, I'm going to send a text message to Nada just that we can't hear her. Um, and uh, Nada. Explain to the regulators, and whenever we're hearing questions like, "Why can't you just move on to another band?" It has equipment are used the operation with the TV so far to the uh, the PMS and continue to enable our uh, uh, and it continue to have secure um, yeah it looks okay. like technology can you hear me now? yes you did, you disappeared for a while but we we continue <laughs> seeing the, the um, can you hear me now? yes we, we can. can hear you <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I hope so, you heard. I copied the presentation. Yes. Yeah, there seems uh, to be a delay. And... Not a, there, there were three documents that we put into the uh, into the handouts that can be accessed by the delegates. Can you just describe what those three documents are? Sure. And no, you can't. Uh, first of all, I shared one of uh, my presentations. Can you hear me yeah. now? Yes. Okay. Perfect. And okay, so I provided uh, first of all the presentation that I just delivered. That was uh, just my name with the uh, Sakya webinar PDF. So this is just a this summary slides of what I just presented. And I also provided a report on uh, PMSC audio spectrum requirements, the SRF report that I referenced during my slides. And uh, you can also access that. Uh, on the APWPT website. We do publish um, reports, new reports every now and then. And uh, it really discusses the summary of the events, the size of the events, and it categorizes the different events across uh, mostly Europe and uh, some other international events like Expo, for example, and it lists uh, really the spectrum requirements for it. Uh, and then moving on to the last document, which is by George Fisher. Uh, it's basically a study over the spectrum demands. It really looks into uh, and and basic and also um, speaks really to politicians, regulators, users about the technical requirements of uh, of PMSE in the UHF band and how much really where the PMSE industry uh, needs additional spectrum and that the one that is already provided is not sufficient. Uh, I urge everyone really to read the, these two documents. The George Fisher one really provides a lot of um, really scientific um, info and update, and the SRF provides um, a, a kind of a forecasting, helps really regulators to forecast the required spectrum uh, for the upcoming events based on its size. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nara, and thank you for that uh, uh, informed uh, presentation. Um, on on PMSE and the requirements, the spectrum requirements for PMSE. So thank you for that. Um, and just for our, for to the benefit for our audience, um, SACI is an alliance partner to APWPT, and this is one of the benefits that you 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 do get um, by being a member of SACI. So I would encourage you all to to become a member of SACI so that you can have access to um, to all of this information. Um, through our alliance partners, and we have various alliance partners. One of them is APWT. Now, um, let's do audience engagement again. Um, Kevin, do you have another poll for us? I do. And uh, so let's pull it up um, and uh, and go down to one of the, the, the hot issues here. Uh, Lyndon referred to it earlier. What are the most controversial issues that need to be addressed in the allocation of radio frequencies. Um, so uh, if you can just complete the poll and um, and then once completed, uh, perhaps that's something that uh, one of the other speakers can can pick up on. So 729% voted, 36% voted.
and I'm going to close it off now. So five, four, three, two, one. Let's close the poll and let's share the results. And um, so there you go. The, the hot topic require universal allocation of RS, RF for use by low power PMSE equipment. Okay, great stuff. Um, it looks like our audience is skewed towards BMAC. Um, so yes, uh, our next speaker, uh, Lee Brunet, um, he represents a manufacturer, and in this case, it, it's Sennheiser. Um, he will just talk to us about the manufacturer's perspective around PMSE equipment and what the challenges would be um, should a band 460, 470 to 694 be shared uh, by uh, with mobile operators? Um, uh, Lee, can you also just uh, introduce yourself and, and just a short bio, uh, and then you can start with the presentation. Well, there's there's not much to say. Um... I'm I'm Lee. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, wrong wrong meeting. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm Lee. I I work for Sennheiser South Africa. Um, I I'm the pro sales representative for Sennheiser South Africa. Sorry, I'm a little bit under the weather at the moment. <clears throat> so um, yeah, my role is basically from Sennheiser's perspective is I I look after um the pmse um amongst other things but uh focusing me mainly there now as as a distributor for a manufacturer who's internationally based um it it is our responsibility to to align with with ecos's regulations or the spectrum allocations regulations um and a lot of times this this does get misconstrued as that we are the authority on on the RF, um, and the, the the biggest issues that we've we've got facing is that when changes do come about, and when spectrum gets reallocated, that it does actually get turned around that it is our fault, um, which which does become quite challenging in that regard. Um, especially when you're in a in a sales uh, environment, um, and also when when changes do come about, um, a lot of a lot of the market does seem to um, pull up the handbrake. Yeah. So if if there is shared space that needs to be allocated and needs needs to be managed, that that does become quite trying. Um, you know, in a in a personal capacity, I've taken it upon myself or for Sennheiser South Africa to to actually um, try and allocate certain RF segments to certain um, areas. So, for instance, at the moment, I'm working with broadcasters to to remain on a certain um, uh, in a certain bandwidth, so that we have got bandwidth available for uh, live eventing. Yeah. Um, Obviously, uh, for instance, if if I were to look at um, our our main three broadcasters, the the um, their frequency allocation are very similar, um, as they are controlled environments and and brick and mortar, yeah. And so there, I can I can give them a certain bandwidth to work within, and they. They stick within it, and then for live eventing, we can look at different bandwidths within the spectrum that we are allowed to work within. And yeah, you know, it it just becomes quite a quite a juggle. I've got a spreadsheet of of a kilometer long, who's got what and where they sit. Um, the other challenge comes in is when you start. Obviously, there's a there's a lot more to this than just um, purely radio microphones and in your monitors um, you know we've got wireless comms we've got two-way radios that all share the same space and these are a lot of the times the the orphan children that don't get uh, mentioned and we need to we need to be cognizant of that 
um, specifically from a manufacturer's perspective or a distributor's perspective. It doesn't help me going and providing a a block of RF, you know, 470 to 690. And um, that particular production house has got um, that same block for for two-way radio and comms usage. It's just it's setting us up for failure. So, so there's a lot of allocation and um, coordination that needs to, to actually take place. And this is kind of, yeah, this is the first time I'm actually getting out on a platform and actually making this plea. You know, there's, there's frequency coordination's got to happen. And, and it's not a, it's, it's not a once off issue. This is an ongoing thing. You know, um, I always say, uh, from from the manufacturer's perspective, I always say, you know, we don't doubt that the electricity, when there's not load shedding, of course, we don't doubt that the electricity is not in the plug. Yeah, it's there. RF is unseen. Yeah, we don't know what is in in the ether, what we, what is in there. We don't, we can't, we cannot see it. It's not something that a lot of people can grasp. It's not tangible, and yeah, we need to be aware of of what spaces we're sharing, what spa whose whose toes we're stepping on, and uh, especially from from an eventing point of view, um, there's there's a lot, and and demands of shows are getting higher. Yeah, I mean if we look at uh, and and Mark will will actually um, probably speak a bit more about this, but demands are getting greater on shows. Um, thus, there's more RF actually being used on shows. I mean, if I look at a simple show like um, Afrikaans is Groot, we're sitting at over 100 channels of RF these days yeah, for, a, for a show. So, yeah, without further ado, that's that's kind of my, my perspective. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it further, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's, we can talk all day about this topic. I think uh, let's let's have a listen to, to what, what else is out there um, and from our perspective people need to be cognizant and coordinate thanks you're muted thanks Lee uh, and and this is exactly the point uh, coordination is quite key um, and now I want to hand over to Mark just to talk a little bit about the user's perspective and now we're talking uh, the user of the equipment uh, um, the staging equipment. Um, so Mark it, it works for ProSound, um, um, and Mark, I don't have your profile with me, so you have to talk. <laughs> you have to introduce yourself then. Um, so uh, yeah, Mark, over to you. So can you give us um, just a user's perspective of some of the challenges that you may face or is actually currently facing regarding? Um, uh, PMSE equipment and, and the sharing of, of spectrum, um, should that occur? Mark's the technical director at ProSound. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm just a little bit concerned that we've had Lee talking about being an alcoholic and now I'm classified as a user. But it's, uh, <laughs> a anyway, the, um, right, my name's Mark. I've been involved in the live and eventing rental industry now since the 1970s. So it's given me a very unique perspective to see how the progression and the dependence on radio has actually been in our industry. Just as an example of doing a musical in the 70s, we were lucky if we had two radio mics uh, that we used to bounce around between principal cast members. And those were all operating in the VHF range. And we were subjected to interference from goodness knows what, whether it was taxi drivers, whether it was uh, any uh, local walkie-talkie networks, etc. So it wasn't uncommon to have a, a character on stage suddenly blurting out that they were going to pick up a, a, a fare from somebody around the corner from the theater. Um, just a little bit distracting. We're, we're going through now to, I'm. Fortunately, I'm currently working on shows and I'm working on a musical as we speak now. Uh, and then that show, I've got a requirement of close on 60 uh, RF channels. And this is classified as a small musical. Um, and this show is taking place in the Monte Casino environment. 
Um, so although I've got my little blanket on the show that I'm working on the 60 RF requirements, I'm next to a, another theatre that's uh, also got a show that's using RF, which is mostly using another 10 to 15 channels. We're also in the casino environment where they've got one-man bands operating, they've got conference rooms operating, uh, they've got people on the gaming floor all making announcements. So it's not unusual within that Monte Casino environment to have a, a requirement of over 250 RF channels at any point in time. Um, and the only way that that happens and happens well is with some form of coordination. But a lot, a lot of people ask why so many channels on a musical and I think we need to just start off by clarifying that so you understand why we need it rather than it just being a case of excess. And when I talk musicals, obviously we're talking, as Lee mentioned, we're talking um, any large scale music events, whether it's Afrikaans is uh, whether it's a rock and roll festival or whether it's a musical. But I mean, if you take a, an average musical, I've got 24 to 32 people in the cast. All of them need to be individually mic'd. Uh, so that's already a 32 channel allocation. A lot of my principles due to the fact that they don't lead stage are double mic'd. So we can have at least another 12 channels that are allocated to people who are wearing two packs to ensure that there's no disruption in performance. Uh, a lot of the shows we now have instrumentation that comes on and off during the production and that is all on some form of RF. So again you can have 15 to 20 channels of that. Um, we then start to look at in-ear monitoring. Um, although it's not that prevalent in musicals, it is prevalent in the other live event side of it. But again, we can be talking 16 to 24 channels of IEM happening at the same time. We've then got all of the radio communications happening on the actual stage floor between the stage management and the various technical departments. Whereas that used to be traditionally all on cable, it's now all on RF because of convenience and safety with not having the cables all running around. And again, that can be easily another 24 to 28 channels of RF that are required. Um, and then we still have a little bit of RF that's used for ancillary equipment where we're trying to link uh, devices. You know, um, and that's that's just in a single musical. So when we're multiplying that, if we're in a casino environment, if we're in a performing arts centre where they've got multiple venues, or if we're in a conference centre where they're trying to do multiple events at the same time, uh, it all gets exacerbated. And unfortunately, with what's happening now, we've got people who have become very comfortable with a pl plug and play concept. In other words, oh, I'm going to do an event. Therefore, I grab a, a rack of 24 radio mics out of my store, I put them on the show, and I run it. Um, I'm not necessarily encompassing everybody in the industry here. I'm just saying it's become a little bit of a common practice. And the reason is because it always worked. We could put it there, we could tune into some little white spots that were actually quite comfortable to use, and we did our show. We didn't bother having to notify anybody. We didn't have to worry about other people interfering with us. That's, that situation is changing and changing quickly and the only way we're going to cope with it now is to get some form of management happening. As Lee referred to, he's already been looked at from a supplier point of view that the allocations are going to various users. But you know, there are hundreds, in, uh, uh, Kevin's got the stats, people out there uh, who are rental companies in our environment. And, you know, and you're not necessarily going to be able to keep control over that because you're not supplying directly to all of those individual users. So you know, it's going to be imperative we have control. And we not only need control in terms of frequency allocation, we need control in terms of the types of RF gear that's being used. You know, if everybody's suddenly going to go over to digital, it actually frees us up because our spacing can be closer. Um, it's easier to actually manage, but if we're then working in environments where we've got a bunch of analog with a bunch of digital, the, the chaos that can ensue can be really uh, entertaining on a whole level other than the show. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure Lyndon could actually you know, amplify that. Yeah, thank, thanks Mark, thanks for that. Um, and the scenario of um, the casino, Monte Casino, is a, a good example because if there are 5G services in, in that area and users are using it, you may find that you, and you've got your, your, um, your theatrical show going on, you may find that there are 
issues um, uh, in terms of interference um, in, 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 in that area. And now I want to go back to, 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 to Lyndon um, uh, because uh, last week um, there was, or two weeks ago, there was a spectrum management conference um, uh, which, which Nada, myself and Lyndon attended. And um, some of the speakers, um, those that are pro broadcast said it's not possible to share the band with um, with the mobile operators um, and the mobile operators are saying we need more spectrum no one should be left behind that's what that was the headline on one of the presentations that was made so I would like to hand over to to Lyndon um, there are three agenda items that are that are quite um, um, a hot topic um, one of them is 1.5 um, I uh, I'm embarrassed to say, Kevin, I don't know how to uh, uh, show my presentation on, on the screen. How do I do that? I just want to put up the agenda items and then I want Lyndon just to talk to it uh, for five minutes before we open for Q&A. Ah, there we go. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Uh, yeah. Okay, there we go. So, Lyndon, can you talk us through why are these topics so, these agenda items so controversial? Um, yeah, I think over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Aldred. Um, before I get into the agenda items, let me just give a little bit of background about the World Radio Conference. Um, my the World Radio Conference is held um, every four years by the ITU um, and the idea of the conference is to review and to revise the radio regulations which then of course includes the table of allocations. Um, now although it is a four-week conference um, it's actually the culmination of a four-year process. Um, Preparations for WRC 23 started the day after WRC 19 concluded. So um, WRC 19 set the agenda for WRC 23 and within um, the ITU you have various study groups and working parties looking at the agenda items for the next conference. Um, the WRC 23 agenda um, comprises about 30 various agenda items um, and these three are three of the controversial ones there are a number of other controversial ones as well but um, these pertain to broadcasting it's also important to note that decisions at WRC are taken by consensus there's no voting, so you've got 180 odd countries and you've got to agree as to um, what the outcome should be. Now agenda item 1.2, um, identification of the bands 33 to 34, 36 to 38 um, for IMT. Um, in South Africa, it's only the bands 3,300 to 34, um, 6425 to 7025 and 7025 to 7125 that are applicable. The other bands are um, applicable to um, the Americas only. Now, as far as broadcasting goes, these frequency, well, 33 three to 34 is a done deal for Africa for IMT. There's not much we can do about that. Um, 642. 6425, um, 7025 megahertz are frequency bands that are um, fixed satellite service C band frequencies, and a lot of broadcasting takes place in C band. Um, again, fixed satellite services and mobile satellite services are not compatible. So, if mobile gets into these bands, it's going to have an impact on. Um, broadcasting feeds and backhaul. Similarly, agenda item 1.3 is to consider 
a primary allocation in the band 363.8 megahertz to mobile services. Currently, mobile services are allocated on a secondary basis. That is a non-interference, non-protection basis. And they are looking to upgrade this to 363.8. Again, this is um, fixed satellite service um, C band used for the whole South African terrestrial network is fed by C band. So if mobile gets in there, um, the services can't coexist, we're going to have a problem. Um, or the fixed satellite services will have to migrate. Importantly to note on 1.3 is that this band is not um, intended to be identified for IMT. It is merely an, merely an update of an upgrade of the mobile service from secondary to primary. However, there are certain parties that are looking to include IMT or load falls outside of the scope of the agenda item and that makes it controversial. And this was one of the issues that was raised in the Spectrum Management Conference in Cape Town two weeks ago. So it's going to be a big fight. But getting on to the agenda item that's particularly relevant to broadcasting is agenda item 1.5. To review spectrum use and spectrum needs of existing services in the band 470 to 960 and consider possible regulatory actions in 470 to 694. You will note there is no mention of any changes to the allocations. It is purely, purely to review the spectrum use and spectrum needs. Now within the ITU working parties, um, a survey was conducted amongst um, member states as to the current needs, particularly in 470 to 694. And again, of importance in Africa is that virtually all the respondents came back to say that 224 megahertz is needed for broadcasting. As Nada correctly mentioned, there are a number of options within task group six. One of the ITU, which was the um, task group that was uh, charged with reviewing this item. And again, um, there are parties that are looking to introduce IMT into this band. Um, we know one of the reasons why IMT or, or mobile services and broadcasting cannot coexist is the power differential. Um, broadcasting will wipe out um, the mobile services. As I indicated earlier, broadcasting has 224 megahertz um, of spectrum allocated to it. Um, IMT has 19,000 megahertz, and they keep on asking for more. At virtually each and every World Radio Conference since um, 2000, there's been an agenda item looking for more spectrum for IMT, and it's just going on and on and on. Um, so they are looking to move broadcasting out of this, and this is going to be a problem. <clears throat> As Nada also correctly mentioned, um, there's a footnote 5.296 to the radio regulations. Now footnotes to the allocations contain additional allocations. And in this case, the band um, is allocated um, to the land mobile service on a secondary basis, i.e. non-protection, non-interference basis for services ancillary to broadcasting and program making. If mobile comes in there, um, again, there is going to be a problem with PMSE. Where are they going to go? Um, perhaps let me stop there and um, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lyndon, and thanks for that for that information. Um, so I, I have a real example of of interference so on um, DTT in in Johannesburg um, there's a, a max 2 uh, which is the ETV multiplex is operating on 770 megahertz 
Um, and I think after um, this Spectrum auction, Spectrum was allocated to the, 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 the mobile operators. Um, I started experiencing interference on, on that frequency. I've logged um, an, a complaint with um, ICASA, the regulator, and it looks like um, the issue is a licensing issue. Can you just explain what, what they mean when they say that it's a licensing issue? One of the basic principles of spectrum management is when you allocate a new service, the existing incumbent services should be protected. Unfortunately, ECASA does not adhere to this. They've done something similar in um, the fixed satellite service bands where they have allocated spectrum to um, fixed wireless access and it's interfering um, with this. Um, again, there's a difference between allocation and licensing. Allocation merely identifies a band for a particular service. Once you have that um, band identified, you then license within that band to specific users under specific conditions. Now, as I indicated earlier, um, we all know that um, broadcasting migration from analog to digital has not been completed. And that in fact, broadcasters are using the entire band from 470 up to 854 megahertz. This is in accordance with the radio regulations. But ICASA in its wisdom um, has allocated um, 694 to 790 megahertz solely to the mobile services, ignoring the fact that broadcasting is still operating in there. So if there is interference, um, ICASA needs to resolve this as a matter of urgency. However, um, it appears that they are loath to do so. Similarly, 790 to 862, we have broadcasting services in 790 to 854 megahertz. They are migrating out. Once digital migration is completed, there then still needs to be a digital to digital migration to move all broadcasting services below um, 694 megahertz. But until that happens, ICASA has a duty to protect those incumbent services in the band, which unfortunately they are not doing. Thanks. Ah, there we go. So the reason why I'm mentioning that is, let's say, for example, if if the band does get shared with um, the mobile operators, um, we'll probably have a similar uh, issue because this is a real practical example of of interference that's happening right now. Um, so let me leave that there. Um, I think we need to give our audience a chance to uh, for Q and A. Uh, but before that, um, we have one. Uh, additional poll that we will that I'll ask Kevin to run and then I'll ask Kevin to facilitate the Q&A session for us. Over to you Kevin. So thanks Bob. I, um, I have to say that uh, I've been monitoring both the chat and the Q&A uh, and we haven't had any questions that have come up in either. <laughs> so um, I'm going to put up this one last poll but I'd really like to encourage members of the audience to uh, to ask questions um, and so the um, uh, the last question uh, that we had up on our screen uh, was what can be done in South Africa to protect the investment already made in legacy PMSE equipment uh, we don't actually have uh, a lot of, of options up on the screen at the moment uh, and one of the things that I was hoping we could do is use this not only to gather information, but to use it as an opportunity to uh, to encourage some some audience participation. So um, I'm I'm keeping it open for now, uh, and I think that you are going to be blown away when you see the response. Uh, certainly, um, oh no, we're getting a few more a few more comments. Uh, I'm not going to leave it open for very long. Five. Four, 
three, two, one. I'm now closing it and I'm going to share the results. And here we are. Uh, essentially, what people are saying is that they want to extend the availability of RF frequencies for the exclusive use of PLT equipment. So um, let's put that down and perhaps just have uh, have some people share feedback on on uh, on what the solutions are. So uh, any any comments or questions from the audience? And while we're waiting for those to come in, anybody want to, to pick up on from a practical point of view, uh, what we could yeah, do? I know, yeah. you know, everybody's been speaking about uh, sharing information and, and putting together a database that defines uh, w what frequencies are, are available in different locations. Uh, any ideas? Maybe a question uh, is uh, should should the band four sixty two six nine four be shared with the mobile operators? Um, what what would that look like? Um, would it be a, a, the upper block um, that would be assigned? Um, because we we understand that uh, sharing is not or co-location is not possible. Um, so how would that work, and how would this impact the the the, the, the manufacturers? Um, okay, thank you for the question, Aldrid. Uh, allow me to share with you an example from a real life uh, situation in the United States of America. Uh, so in 2017, uh, the FCC have uh, uh, released that it will uh, um, basically allocate this usage of from 614 to 694 megahertz to the mobile and there has been an auction uh, for it and it was the band was given to the uh, mobile operators and we as the PMSE industry were given a uh, transitional phase to uh, basically either um, exchange or deal with the um, equipment that is working on the 600 we had to uh, retrieve everything from the market uh, users were also asked to return or exchange their equipment, so there were no longer PMSC equipment available. And uh, there was after this transitional uh, period finished, the entire band was uh, given for mobile, and uh, basically the stations, mobile stations, were uh, uh, distributed and deployed within the different uh, areas within the states. Now, looking into uh, February 2022 just uh, um, almost a year back, less than that, uh, the Super Bowl event, which is the one mega sports event in the US where large and um, let's say um, important uh, performers are there. It's a very uh, uh, maybe high level uh, event to the uh, people of the US. So when that event was planned, uh, it, they, it was realized that the 600 megahertz band is required and it's needed. And without it, it would be almost impossible to um, cater for the planned uh, performance. So due to the, uh, the chance maybe that the event or the stadium where the um, Super Bowl was taking place, there were no IMT deployment, there were no stations in that area and a special approval, a special temporary approval by the um, uh, event organizers, by the PA rentals at the time, uh, was requested by the, to the FCC to grant them the usage of the uh, 600 uh, megahertz. And they were able to uh, get the equipment from other neighboring countries because at the time there was no equipment the MSC in the US allowed to work on the 600. And the event took place and the additional spectrum was temporarily authorized for usage for PMSE for the Super Bowl event. Now, and that happened and uh, now looking into future, supposedly if it is to deploy IMT base stations on that are uh, uh, working on the 600 uh, megahertz. So what would the uh, performer, the organizers do? What would the FCC, how will it support? We have raised these questions to the regulators telling them what can we do really, what are the solutions that um, you're offering us as a regulator from the spectrum side, if this additional spectrum was given to mobile and utilized. Same question also was raised to the UAE regulators uh, looking into the expo event, 
where uh, 600 to 700 was also heavily utilized. And the regulator's response really to us would be, we will try to uh, coordinate with the operators to temporarily switch off stations if that is, if that is uh, possible and if it's urgently needed. So currently we're looking into really solutions. Uh, we're not only um, relying on this, the available spectrum, we're also looking into uh, exploring new bands, maybe not as good as the UHF, but we're doing that right now. And we're hoping that uh, giving the 600, you know, the uh, 600 use case that took place in the US uh, will really tell the regulators that, you know, this is enough. Uh, the mobile maybe doesn't need more and really um, fixed amounts of spectrum should be dedicated for PMSE users. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Kevin, any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, so I have a question here from uh, MJ Mashokwe, who says, when suppliers get gear to sell to end users, is it possible to change frequency bands being ordered into the country? I'm asking, he says, because the majority of the country has gear in the same frequency band. If we are in an event venue, and my show alone takes 150 frequencies, this means it's rough for the next company setting up, or are the frequency bands as allowed by ICOSA? Okay, so maybe, I don't know, between Mark and Lee, you want to respond to that question? Yeah, look, I'm quite happy to chime in. Obviously, we are governed by what we can bring in. Um, you know, we we need to get a class of approval for for what we um, what we can provide. So, yeah, it it does make it difficult. So we are we only have approval for for certain bandwidth, um, and we actually made it our mission this year to to get approval for everything that's available. So um, we've got we've got approval for most of the, the the allotted bandwidth at this stage and uh, yeah I try from our side as a supplier I do try to to coordinate between companies it's not always 100% possible because uh, uh, like you said there's just so many of them um, and also you know I can only look at my product I don't know um, what the competition's doing out there um, <clears throat> But for for myself, for for Sennheiser, I can tell you, you know, this is this is who I'm supplying what, um, so that when uh, I actually know MJ, um, so if MJ is doing an event and uh, he's got X amount of radios, I can tell him, look, you can go and hire an additional X from company X Y Z. Um, because they will be in a different bandwidth to you. So, yeah, I'm I'm constantly doing that. But uh, you know, like I say, I don't know what what the rest of the manufacturers out there are actually doing to to curb this. Um, but from from our side, we only are allowed to sell a certain uh, certain bandwidths um, and certain certain frequency allotments that. That we are allowed to sell, which we have uh, approval for. Um, you know, the the other thing is is that you don't want to sell something without approval because there's obviously there's, it has a snowball effect. You know, um, as an end user, you will you will be fined. You will have uh, have your gear eventually taken away or something like that, and then it comes back to me as a distributor, and I will end up. Uh, in trouble as well. So there's, the, it has a snowball effect. So um, as as a distributor, we have to be responsible, and we have to uh, follow the governance. So if if the governance says we are only allowed to use these frequencies, we try and get approval for all of them. Certain times they do not allow us to get approval for all said frequencies, and then we have to work within the scope that they've given us. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm conscious of time. So, um, are there any other questions, Kevin? No other questions that have come through uh, okay. either on the uh, the chat or in the uh, the Q and A. Okay, great. Do we have one more poll to do? 
We don't. Or, no, 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 no. So perhaps we can just so, ask each person to wrap up. Yeah. So I would like to thank our, our um, speakers for 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 sharing the um, experience with us and the knowledge around um, this topic. And I want to to just go um, 30 seconds for each speaker just to do a last last uh, comments. Um, so let's start with with Lyndon. Thanks, Alred. I think really the takeaway is that broadcasting and mobile services cannot coexist in the same geographic area on the same frequency. Um, mobile, uh, broadcasting services have a limited amount of spectrum available to them. The mobile services, particularly um, 5G broadband, has more than enough spectrum some of that spectrum is not yet being licensed and is not yet being used and that um, we need to protect broadcasting spectrum wherever we can. Thank you. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I mean, listening to what everybody's had to say and the questions, I think we've just got to accept that we're going into a precarious time and the only way that we're really going to survive it is with communication, no pun intended. And I think all the, the, the you know, especially the major users of RF technology, we need to be talking um, so that we can actually try and do our best to fit in. And, you know, I think the more we don't upset any of the other people in the band, the more we're going to get away with it um, in the nicest way possible. But we, we need to start talking. Okay, great stuff. Um, then Lee, I'll give Nada, the lady, the last word. So Lee, and then Nada. Yeah, look, I, I, I just have to reiterate, you know, communication and coordination. That's that's all we can do to, um, to to make this work. I mean, the the spectrum just gets smaller and smaller every day. There's so much happening out there, and uh, yeah, if these these uh, cellular guys are going to start taking more away from us, then we're going to have to just start talking. Okay, thanks for that. Nada? Nada, you muted. We can't hear you. You can hear me now, I think. So yeah. I want to echo again what everyone uh, mentioned about continuing to advocate uh, for Spectrum for PMSA usage. I also want to um, highlight not only we need to communicate, we also need to document. Uh, I'm, I believe uh, the, uh, uh, the different RF engineers are doing a great job making sure that the uh, event takes place no matter what the cost is. And we need to really uh, document the challenges and the problems that they're facing, especially with spectrum shortages, uh, so as to communicate it effectively to the uh, regulators. And um, we need to keep uh, speaking to regulators on a national levels and uh, international levels to ensure that we still have access to uh, spectrum. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for, for being here. Thank you to our audience also for, for their participation and interacting in, in the polls. And thank you to Kevin for sorting out the, all the technicalities. Um, so that's the end of our webinar. And um, please be um, keep your ears and eyes, okay, your eyes glued to uh, the social media pages um, so that we can communicate to you um, our next um, webinar and topic of discussion for uh, just to keep our members informed about what the industry developments are um, in our industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and that's it. The close. No, Al, that we have recorded it. Um, and so I will um, I will post it on our uh, our YouTube channel and on our social media platforms. So that if uh, if you want to refer the discussion to any of your colleagues, it will be available for them as well. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank Thanks. you very much. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Cheerio. Thank you.